Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Living Word. It's good to have you worshiping with us today. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, a number of announcements before you. Probably the most notable one is that uh, we have a new musical instrument in the front of our church. It just sounds really lovely. I'm so thankful for, for Jan, for the worship committee, uh, for their initiative with that. Um, I was talking with Pastor Scramstead this last week, and I learned something new. He said, um, that issues that we've been having with that organ, we've been having for longer than just a couple of years. The repairman had told Pastor Tim 10 years ago that we needed to start looking to replace what we had. And so I'm um, thankful that that has come to fruition. Thankful to the elder board and the worship committee for their uh, insight in pursuing that and uh, looking forward to how we can uh, bless the Lord through that instrument as well as we worship. You'll see our schedule for this week. Uh, this Tuesday, we have our elders meeting. Wednesday, we will continue by having our Wednesday night Bible studies and Wednesday morning women's study as well. Uh, we're meeting, we have one adult class that's meeting here, one that's in the Bible study room, and then Maddie is leading our youth, and then we've got some Kingdom Kids stuff as well. So uh, we're trying to move back toward normal with uh, some spacing and precautions, and it seems like it's going well. This coming Saturday, we will be having our men's uh, Bible study, usually men's prayer breakfast, but we're going to be praying and fasting, not breaking the fast. So we'll be uh, coming together and hopefully that doesn't preclude too many men. I know that we get together and we like to eat, but hopefully we can get together to pray and read our Bibles too. So that will be this Saturday at 8 o'clock. And then next week on Sunday will be kind of the same thing. We'll have our drive-in service at 9. Our plan is to do that throughout the rest of the year. Um, seems like that's uh, meeting a need. And we had even more new visitors here today that we haven't seen before. So it's fun to, to see some of that as well. Uh, we will have our uh, shortened Bible study time between the service, and we wish we could be meeting for longer and have more discussion, but we're trying to at least move toward having some Christian education again on Sunday morning, so that's at 10 o'clock, and then we'll continue with our services at 10.30. Uh, if you know people who aren't able to make it to any of our Bible studies, either in person on Wednesdays or on Sunday morning, we do have a number of different video courses that are offered online, and I think we have about 80 hours of video on there now. And so um, for you, some of you who have taken advantage of those early in the summer, you'll see some updated courses on there, and um, all of our Sunday school Bible studies will be also on our website, so feel free to follow along with that. I think that's all the announcements that I have then this morning. We open up our service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our call to worship is from Philippians chapter 4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Let's uh, go ahead and stand as we sing our opening hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy.
congregation may be seated. One of the things that we really value doing on a weekly basis here at our church is recognizing our need for Jesus. And uh, there's a number of, of ways that we recognize that, but one of them is by recognizing our need for him. Uh, the brokenness that's in our lives, the ways that we fall short, and the things that we regret doing, saying, and thinking that we know break the heart of God and breaks the heart of those around us. Uh, if you ever are in need of a reminder, the person sitting next to you probably can fill you in on some of those ways. But I'm hopeful today that the Spirit of God will convict your heart and point you to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's join together confessing our sin before the Lord this morning. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you for Christ's sake, grant us forgiveness of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, Increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We hear a promise from scripture from Isaiah chapter 1. God says to his people, though your sins were as scarlet, you shall be as white as snow. Though you were stained as red, you will be like wool. And God's point to his people is that even though there was a, a stain because of our sin in our lives, that God will restore, renew, and cleanse us, uh, proclaiming forgiveness for our lives. Uh, rest in that promise of God today. As we continue in our service, we invite for our teachers to come forward today. Uh, today is our first day of doing some of our Sunday morning teaching and so to ask for those who are printed there in the bulletin, step forward. We have Cindy Johnson, who's involved with some of our Wednesday uh, teaching for the women's Bible study. We have Jessica Hornish, who is teaching with some of our children uh, in the Sunday mornings and also is teaching a part of the Wednesday uh, morning group. Uh, Jan Tollison is teaching also the Wednesday morning women's group study. Uh, Joni Mayer, Beth Nelson, and Mark Rusted are faithfully watching over a ministry to our children. And then uh, Kyle Smith as our intern, and then also Maddie as our new uh, youth worker and uh, shepherding our youth. So we're thankful for all of these up here and want to um, install them as our church uh, teachers, those who are faithfully watching over uh, our congregational life. Cindy, Jan, Joni, Beth, Mark, Kyle, and Maddie, you have been chosen to serve as teachers for Living Word Lutheran Church. Hear the word of the Lord concerning the office of teaching in God's church. From Ephesians chapter 4, He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Friends, it will be your duty to remember your students in prayer to be diligent in your weekly preparation for teaching, to be attendance at divine worship, and to maintain order and discipline in your classrooms, to show your students at all times a good example both in word and in deed, to discharge the duties of your office according to the constitution of this church and the teaching and practices of the faith. As you think about these responsibilities and realize that your strength may at times be insufficient, you are encouraged to remember that our sufficiency is from God. I commend you to the grace of God and Jesus who said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so I ask you, teachers, on behalf of Living Word Lutheran Church, do you accept this office to which you have been called? And do you promise to fulfill your duties faithfully and in accordance with the word of God and constitution of this church? If so, please answer, yes, by the grace of God. Yes, by the grace of God. May God grant you grace as you strive to keep this promise as a solemn covenant before him in this congregation. Let's pray for our teachers. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the men and women who are standing up here today, whom you have called and chosen to be faithfully administering your word to this church. I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen them in this task, uh, equip them 
for this good work of teaching and bringing up people in the faith. Would you do this, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's uh, welcome them as our teachers for this year. Thank you. I'd like to invite uh, Maddie to come up here and just share with us briefly. Uh, Maddie, you can just come over to this mic right here. I want her to just introduce herself as uh, our new youth worker and share just a little bit about her heart and passion with us. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you, Pastor. Um, as he said, my name is Maddie Rare, and I'm really excited um, to be used by God in this role. Um, more importantly, I'm really excited for the congregation to be a part of our youth group as well. I'm hoping to plan some things where um, our youth is more involved and more engaged, and I'm hoping to have um, opportunities for you all to be involved in that, too. Um, I, I'm just really excited for everything God's going to do um, in the next year and throughout the rest of this time. So thank you so much. It's really a blessing for us to have uh, Maddie in our midst and serving as a youth worker for us, and so we'll uh, be thankful to uh, also support you in that, Maddie. Our, our goal is not just to have people come along to do ministry and then just let them go at it uh, by themselves, but to come alongside and accompany them in that role. Uh, as we look to our temple talk for today, I want us to think about a pretty common colloquial phrase in our world today that it takes a village to raise a child. Uh, remember, for me, uh, growing up as a kid, I lived this a lot of times. Uh, there are maybe different situations where I would come home and say, oh, hey, uh, this person told me this today. And my dad would look at me and say, I've been trying to tell you that for five years. And, uh, you know, it just took the right person at the right time who would reaffirm the same truth that I had been hearing at home in order for me to accept that and to hear that. And I think that's also true in the church. It takes a church to raise a Christian. Uh, even for those who have grown up in godly homes and have been a good, get, gotten a good example to follow from their parents, it is also just as valuable for them to hear the truths of God reaffirmed in the lives of this church. Uh, that you have a vital role in mentoring, encouraging, and shepherding, and watching over uh, all of the people that are, are in our church here. It's not just the role of these teachers, it's not just the role of the pastor. But God has called and equipped for each and every one of us to do that. Uh, for, for someone who has children, I am thankful that my kids get a chance to not just hear the truth about God for myself and for my wife, Emily. I'm thankful that they get to hear it from you too. Uh, you are a vital part of raising my kids to follow Jesus. Uh, you are a vital part of each of the youth following after Jesus as you get a chance to speak into their lives and share God's word with them and pray for them. You are reaffirming the things that Maddie's teaching them, the things that they're hearing at home from their parents. Uh, all of us have a part to play in that. And so I would encourage you as you think about uh, the installation of these teachers, as you think about our youth worker that is starting now, that you would recognize it's not just their role, but that God has chosen you, uh, each and every one of us, to be part of, of raising up a new generation of people who would follow after the Lord. And as a parent myself, I'm thankful for you uh, serving in that role. As we continue our service, we'll have a time of congregational sharing and, and prayer requests. Uh, just to share a couple that were brought to us at the drive-in service, uh, asking for prayers for teachers and parents and for students as they navigate into this new school year. Uh, for our family especially, too, we've noticed that Josiah and Caleb start school tomorrow, and they're going just one day a week, and then we'll be taking homework home and working on it the rest of the week at home. And it's an adjustment for families and for teachers and for parents to navigate through this. So be praying for them. Uh, I also got a chance to visit with the Almiehu family. And uh, Nathan is going to be going up to Duluth and starting school. Uh, he started college here last week, a kind of a hybrid situation. And uh, Daniel is doing all of his classes at home via online. Uh, so be in prayer for that family as well. Uh, Cindy Bartelt is going to be having a medical procedure tomorrow on her vocal box. Uh, so be praying for her. And then Saprina asked for prayer for her friend Margie, who is having a lobectomy on Tuesday. So those are some of the things we can be praying for. And any other prayer requests we can be bringing before the Lord today? Yeah, Cheryl. Uh, a childhood friend of mine called the other night from Ashland, Oregon. Okay. 
evacuation pack by the door ready to go and since then I think things have got even worse and it was mm. been three miles back and her name is Marsha okay. and Art and Art has uh, Parkinson's disease so he has health issues too so pray okay. for Marsha and Art because they may have had to evacuate by now Okay, so Cheryl has a friend, Marsha, and her husband, Art, who are living in Oregon and uh, probably have had to evacuate because of the situation out there, so we'll be praying for them. Good. Anyone else we can be praying for today? Let's bring these things before the Lord then. Heavenly Father, we just uh, come before you today with thankful hearts, thankful that you hear our prayers, and Lord, that you invite us to cast all things before you. And Lord, some of us have these things that you've laid on our hearts to share, but some of us have things that maybe are weighing heavy on our hearts that uh, we're not sure how to even articulate. Uh, but Lord, you see even the deepest, darkest parts of our lives, uh, things that we're burdened by and the things that we bear. I pray, Lord, that you'd be working the lives of your people here today, strengthening them as we navigate through the world that we live in. We particularly pray today for our teachers, uh, for parents, for students as they enter into the school year. It's a very different school year than we've had to walk through before. Uh, we pray for our college students and those who are in primary and secondary school, Lord, pray that you would bless them as they try to make it work and study and, and uh, continue to prepare. We pray also especially for Nathan as he goes up to Duluth to start college classes. We pray, Lord, that you would be uh, continuing to plug him into a faith community up there, that he would be nourished and fed through your word. We pray for Cindy Bartelt as she has this medical procedure tomorrow on her vo voice box. We pray, Lord, for a successful procedure for her and that you would be bringing strength back to her body. We also pray for Sabrina's friend Margie who is having this lobectomy on Tuesday and commit her to your care in that. Uh, we continue to pray for Rondi, and uh, thank you that she has been able to uh, be admitted to a hospital for some stability for her needs. Pray that you would continue to uh, bring strength, Lord, to both her mind and body as she um, deals with some new medications. We also pray for Cheryl's friend, Marcia, and her husband, Art, as they are thinking about uh, evacuating or maybe already have out in Oregon. We pray for all of those in our West Coast as they're dealing with the wildfires that are going on out there. Lord, we pray that you would allow our first responders and those who are on the front lines to, to be able to put out the fires and that you would bring safety to the people in those communities. Lord, all these things we pray in your name and we pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Congregation, please rise for the reading of our word, uh, God's word today. And we'll ask for Phil to come and uh, read our scripture lesson today. My lesson comes from Jeremiah, chapter 17, verses 13 through 14. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth, for they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. The epistle lesson is from James, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The uh, gospel lesson is from John chapter 5, 
verses 1 through 14. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been invalid for 30 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred. And while I'm going down, when I'm, when I'm going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take your bed and walk. And at, that, and at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was a Sabbath, so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is a Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to be, take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, the man, the man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had been drawn, as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. No more, sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. So ends the reading. Every week we have a, a short little summary of our faith that we confess together. Uh, we do that as a way to encourage one another, and we also do it as a way to uh, remind each other and as a way to teach each other as well. And so let us confess our faith in the, together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. During this time of COVID, we're still doing our offering uh, a little bit differently, uh, but that doesn't mean um, that we uh, still are, can't be thankful for, for what the Lord has, has done for us and what he has given to us. And so we can still do our offering response together. <laughs> And uh, we're going to be singing together hymn number 570, Jesus, Savior, Pilot Me.
pray. Lord Jesus, as we come now to hear from your word. Lord, I ask that you would do as you have promised to do, that every single time your word goes forth, that it is powerful and effective to work in the lives of your people. I pray, Lord, that as we hear it, that we would be convicted of sin and pointed to our Savior, Jesus Christ, and that you would teach us how to follow after you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the next four months, we're going to be walking through the book of James for our sermon series. And uh, for me as a pastor, I love it when we take times to do this uh, here at our church, where we get to preach through a book of the Bible. And uh, the reason I love that is because it gives a little bit of context. You know, sometimes you're looking at a passage of scripture for a sermon, uh, but you maybe miss the things that happened before or after it. But when you preach through a book, you get a chance to just hear all of it over you know, a process of some weeks and months. And so we're going to commit ourselves for the next four months through the book of James and uh, see what God would have to teach us in that. If you think about the book of James, there's a, a tagline that I want you to think about. And that tagline is faith in action. Faith in action. Uh, one of the things that we hear throughout the rest of the New Testament and the other authors, Paul and some of the other apostles, is this idea that we are justified by faith alone. And what they mean by that is that it's faith alone that makes us right with God. It's faith alone that brings us close to a right relationship with God. It's not our works. It's not anything that we're doing. It's our faith. And, and that's true. But sometimes what happens for us as Christians is that we live by faith and we just kind of coast we kind of get complacent or maybe apathetic as we just are holding on to our faith in who Jesus is and what he's done. And not to belittle Paul or the other apostles, but James comes in and he reminds the church, hey, you're not saved by your works, but they matter. Faith without works is dead, James says. And so the Christian's call is not to just have faith, but that people would see that that faith is evident in our lives by our words and our deeds. And so as we think about what James is writing here through these five chapters, this small little book, we're going to see that call repeatedly come forward to not just only be living our life following Jesus, but that people would see that, that they would see, hey, yeah, those people are Christ followers. Not that those actions make us better with God or let us pat ourselves on the back, but that it's evidence that God has truly done a work in our hearts and lives. As you think about who is writing this book, I want to just step back and give a little perspective of this guy named James. Uh, this man named James is the brother of Christ. We hear in Mark chapter 6, verse 3, is, uh, this is referring to Jesus as he's with the crowds. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. You see, some of the people who were hearing Jesus from his own hometown were like, this guy, we grew up with him. We know this guy, this Jesus. He's, his dad's a carpenter. And we've seen his family. We've seen these brothers and sisters. And now this Jesus is the Messiah? You know, the, the people of Nazareth kind of had a hard time believing that at first. They knew this guy. They grew up with him. And at first, we hear that the rest of Jesus' brothers and sisters, though those that uh, Mary and Joseph, after Jesus was born, they get married to have other kids. These half-brothers and sisters uh, end up being eventually followers of Jesus himself. Uh, James, the one mentioned there first, he was, we hear, one of the leaders in the New Testament church. In the book of Acts, in chapter 15, there's a, a large church council that had gathered, and, and this James is the one who stands up and says, hey, Let's continue to keep a perspective looking to bring the message even to the ends of the earth about Jesus Christ. And uh, this James then is the one who is believed to be the one writing this epistle to us, this leader of the New Testament and brother of Jesus. Uh, just a couple decades ago, there was what is called an ossuary, as a fancy word for a bone box that was found outside of Jerusalem. And on this bone box, this ossuary, was a very unique inscription one that we don't find very often, uh, it said this, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. Most of the times on those ossuaries, it just says the descendants, you know, uh, James, son of Joseph, 
son of this person. Not often do you have those little extra tag lines on there. Uh, but this then is, is what most archaeologists and scholars believe is the same James. There's a leader in the New Testament church, half-brother of Jesus, and the one who's writing this epistle to us. Uh, the thing I love about James, though, is that as he's writing this epistle, as we get into James chapter 1, he's not lording this position. He is a very humble man who recognizes the one that he wants to direct his readers to. That's not himself. It's not James, the leader of the church. It's not James, the one who has a connection with Jesus as a half-brother or whatever. It's James, a servant. This is a guy who uh, would have a lot of reason to maybe boast in his position, but he doesn't. The guy who's writing this, he describes himself as a servant of God, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the man who's writing this book that we're going to get a chance to look at. So that's a little bit of the backdrop then of this character. And now as we uh, start here in verse 1 and getting into the rest of the chapter, why don't you think about why James is writing? We see right away that he's writing to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Uh, for those of you who have read your Bibles, you know in Acts chapter 8 and 9 that the, as a result of Saul and some of the others who are persecuting the church, that the Jewish believers in Jerusalem ended up scattering. They ended up going all across the Roman Empire for fear of their very lives. And James was used by God to write a letter to encourage those believers in the midst of their dispersion, their suffering, to remain true to the faith and to put their faith in action. And that's who James is writing to. Uh, this is a man who is very familiar with suffering. Not only was he guiding the church as they were persecuted and dispersed, but we hear also from church tradition that James himself was stoned to death. Uh, this is a man who knew what it meant to suffer and lived in that kind of climate. And I think that it's very fitting for our church family to look through the book of James because, honestly, friends, we're living in that same kind of climate today. Now, we're living in a world of suffering. We're living in a, a time of trials for the church, uh, both here in the United States, but even more so internationally. Uh, in, in, in the 1900s, more Christians died for their faith than any time throughout human history in the last 1900 years. That was an amazing statistic from Voice of Mars. Cheryl shared that with me. In 100 years, the last 100 years, more Christians have died for their faith than in the previous 1900. Um, there is intense persecution going on around the world for being a Christian these days. And so what would James have to say to our culture that we live in? With a world where we have business owners wondering if they're going to make it, people who are wondering what to do with their family and friends that they haven't seen in months, uh, bank accounts that have taken a hit, school situations that are in upheaval, uh, people who are rioting or protesting and it's hard to discern the difference between the two. We're living in a world where what James would have to teach us about suffering and trials is, I believe, very relevant. And so this is what he says in verse 2. As he's addressing these people who have been persecuted and scattered in the church, James says this, Count it all joy. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Maybe you read that on the screen and you're thinking, wait a second. James, I think you have the wrong word there. Count it all joy when you're facing trials of various kinds? That is not our typical reaction. Oh, when we're facing trials, our normal default position is to say, I want to get out of this as soon as I can. Uh, I do not want to be living underneath this pain or agony that I'm facing. And, and so when our, our bank accounts are low or when we're feeling sick, we have a flat tire on the side of the road, whatever the trial is, we want to get out of that ASAP. But God would ask us to reconsider that approach. God would ask us to, to do something a little bit different when we're facing the trials of our life. He asks us to count it as joy, to count it all joy when we face trials of various kinds. Now, I want us to think of just for a moment about what that means this morning. What does it mean when we think about counting it all joy when we face trials of various kinds? Joy is a very different thing, friends, than happiness. Uh, happiness is an emotion that's based on our circumstance and it goes up and down. 
You may feel really happy one day. You may feel really depressed the next. But joy is something different than an emotion based on our circumstance. Joy is an attitude, a state of being, something that's very deeply rooted within ourselves that doesn't change with the times or situations of our life. Uh, and to give you a little bit of analogy of that, I want you to think about an anchor. Uh, some of you this summer got a chance to go out on a boat. Uh, our family got a chance to do that earlier in August. We went out on, on a pontoon boat. And when you, when you put out an anchor on a boat, the beautiful thing is that you can find a really nice place. You set down that anchor and you're grounded there. You're not moving. You may go up and down because of the waves. The wind may push you around a little bit, but you are anchored there where you've dropped it. And that is kind of the, the similarity between the distinction of happiness and joy. Uh, happiness, you're maybe up and down and a little bit moving around based on circumstances of life, but believers living by joy are anchored to something more deeply rooted in their life. Uh, it's a state of being, an attitude of our, of our life, our perspective on things. Uh, another analogy of this that I've used sometimes is for my little girl Anna, when she comes and gives me a hug, that brings me a lot of happiness. But I have joy in raising kids who love other people. See the difference between those two? One is a, a certain situation that produces an emotion. The other one is a more uh, attitude or state of being about life, a perspective on it. Uh, as I mentioned about the persecuted church, one of the things that has been amazing to me to witness is the joy amidst our persecuted brothers and sisters. Uh, when I was in college, I lived in China for a summer uh, smuggling Bibles into China. And I got a chance to go and, and visit a couple underground churches where believers were gathered that if they were caught, they would be tortured, thrown in prison, or killed. And it was amazing to see their joy they were so glad just to get a copy of the Bible. And they treasured that. They were so grateful and joyful to be called and chosen by God and to be following him with their lives. Sometimes I came back and I saw my friends who had five or six Bibles on their shelf and maybe did certain things for God because they had to. I, I thought about the difference there between somebody who's maybe complacently following God or what does it look like to have faith in action? to be living a life of joy, even amidst the different trials and things that we're facing in our life. Doesn't mean that the trials that we're facing are not hard. They are. Sometimes they're very difficult. Sometimes the things that we're facing in our life are depressing, they're difficult, they're hard. But God invites us to respond differently when we face those. And instead of trying to get out of them as fast as we can, God invites us to have a different perspective to see them as an opportunity, to see them as something that he wants to, to use in our life to help us grow and change, to have faith and trust in him. Uh, it reminds me of the verse that Paul writes about in Romans chapter 8 when he says, God works all things out for the good of those who love him. And do you believe that? Do you believe that that's true? God uses all things for the good of those who love him? I do. I believe that even trials are the things that God uses in our life to test our faith, to see what's really on the inside. Uh, when you're going through something hard, it's often said that you get to see the measure of a man. Are they really going to have a resolve and a perseverance to get through it, or do they just throw up their hands and give up? Uh, God has called us, when we're in those trials, to keep our eyes fixated on Jesus, to remember that, that our life on this side of eternity, it's not all that there is. And that, that we would be able to go through them as an opportunity to grow in perseverance. He says there in verses 3 and 4, you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, or maybe your version says steadfastness. And let perseverance have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. You see, when we grow in this, James says that we become as God intends us, not lacking of anything, but instead having grown in our faith, in our trust of God, recognizing that whatever may come, the ups and downs of our life, that there's something that's a constant, and there's one who's holding on to us through it all. Maybe you're sitting here this morning, you're thinking, well, thanks, God. Thanks for that. Thanks for the big ask of every single trial that I'm going through to have this bigger perspective. To count it all joy, that seems like a, a big thing to put on me, God. 
Well, I want to tell you this morning about another man who went through great trials with perseverance, who counted it all joy amidst the suffering that he faced, and that's our Lord Jesus. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, let us fix our eyes on him, on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scoring at shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, there was another individual who looked with an eternal perspective at the suffering that he faced. Suffering that's far greater than you or I will probably ever have to experience. He looked at it with joy. Why? Not because it was pleasant. Not because it was easy. Because it was worth it. He had an eternal perspective. He recognized that the thing that he was going through meant the salvation for all people a restoration of the brokenness that we have in our relationship with God. And so despite the trials that Jesus went through, he counted it joy. That's the one that we're encouraged to keep our eyes fixed on. That same one who persevered with joy under great trial, the author of Hebrews says, fix your eyes on him. Follow after Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. This is the one, friends, who wants to mold and shape your life to have that same kind of perspective on things. That instead of looking at all of the issues or trials that come up in your life as something I just need to escape from, that instead you would look at it as an opportunity to grow, to draw closer to the Lord, to be stretched, to grow in perseverance and steadfastness and resolve. Uh, For my life, some of the times that I have grown the most were the times that were the most difficult for me. I imagine that's probably true for you too. God uses those moments in our life, as unpleasant as sometimes they are, to remind us of what's really important in life. Uh, I think even of this situation that we've been in during COVID. Uh, How many times have I heard from a number of you that you said you don't realize what you have until it's gone? Uh, There are times where maybe we too have been going through these trials, this really hard time. And maybe it's helped us to actually appreciate things in our life more. Maybe we appreciate just simple things like gathering together as Christians on a Sunday morning when those things are taken away from us. You see, God uses all the different trials that we face to grow us, to test our faith, to build us character and perseverance. My prayer for you as a congregation is that God would do that in your life too. That you would have your eyes fixed on Jesus not only our example, but the one who does these things in your life. As we had read for the teachers from John 15, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who remains in me will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Uh, My call for you today as a pastor would be to abide in Jesus, to rest in him, uh, that it's only through your faith and trust in him that we can make it through anything. And that that would be something that's true for your life today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you call us to a little bit of a different perspective when it comes to living our life than the rest of the world. That instead of trying to escape and get out of suffering as quickly as we can, Lord, that you invite us to look at it as an opportunity to grow. Uh, Lord, to develop a faith and a closer walk with you, Lord. I pray that you would do that in my life. I pray that you would do that in the lives of my friends. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Closing him this morning is the hymn Day by Day. Let's stand as we sing that (coughs) together.
uh, find yourself needing prayer for today, Kyle will be available up here after the service to pray with you. We'd love to have you take advantage of that situation. Receive now the Lord's benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his grace and peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.